like me has a very close interest in what's going on in Serbia right now, where a color revolution, albeit a very pallid one, is uh, underway. Let's start with that one, if we may, uh, George. It's a pretty half-hearted, half-cocked attempt uh, to undo the result uh, of the Serbian elections. Uh, should we stop worrying about it, or is the playbook still open? Well, I, I, it is indeed uh, half-hearted, George. Um, the problem with the uh, the, the anti-Vucic forces who came out en masse is that they got a half-hearted support from the West, whereas the, the Germans, you know, with this crazy woman who runs their foreign policy, Annalena Baerbock, clearly came out in support of them and said, yeah, this is outrageous, unacceptable what Vucic has done. The Americans uh, were much more ambivalent and seemed to side with uh, Vucic against the protesters. So why are the Americans doing this? Well, they see Vucic as really their, their best means of getting Serbia on board for U.S. foreign policy. They think that Vucic, with his credentials, he had worked for Milosevic, he's supposedly a Serbian nationalist, he had been a member of the uh, uh, Sheshels party. He is the best means of getting Serbia to accept Kosovo, uh, the independence of Kosovo, and getting Serbia on board for NATO's anti-Russian policy. They think that the Americans think that if you try to get him out and get one of these um, you know, fake, artificially created liberals in charge, they'll never be able to persuade the Serbs to accept uh, Kosovo. They'll never be able to, uh, the loss of Kosovo. They'll never be able to accept, the, uh, uh, force the Serbs to give up on Russia. So this is their, their their bet, and that's why the Americans have been pushing. Vucic and have not really been that enthusiastic by any of the um, anti-Vucic uh, protests. But they haven't been successful uh, so far. Uh, Vucic has completely resisted uh, their anti-Russian imprecations, sanctions against Russia and so on. Uh, and that's because a very substantial proportion of the Serbian people are very sympathetic to Russia. I know this myself, spend a lot of time there. Uh, but almost everybody in Serbia would revolt against selling out Kosovo. So maybe a forlorn hope on Joe Biden's part. It is a forlorn hope. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think that, you know, unfortunately, the, the Serbian political leadership is is, I think, very insipid, very weak and useless, and would probably go along with um, NATO's uh, entreaties, you know, just do this, do this, and we'll reward you, we'll get you, fast track you into uh, the EU, um, Just, but just follow us on our foreign policy. And, you know, the politicians would be happy to go along with it. The public, however, is absolutely adamantly uh, opposed and that's why the, none of these plans really works out. I mean, Vucic makes, you know, these occasional odd comments like, well, you know, we have to think about our future, you know, our future is it with the EU. Maybe, you know, maybe we, we're gonna, we can help Ukraine. Maybe I, I don't really mind if maybe some Serbian uh, weapons end up in Ukraine. And then right away there is outrage among the Serbian public and uh, and nothing much happens. So, uh, you know, it's, it's it's the problem that yes, you you have a political elite that really they they, they look to the EU uh, uh, and, and NATO as the future, but um, the overwhelmingly the public is uh, very pro-Russian uh, because Russia has been consistently uh, supporting Serbia, and they will not sign off on the loss of Kosovo. It just cannot happen. You know, even after all these years, they will not accept that. God bless them. Uh, what about France, George? Uh, what can you tell us, if there's anything to tell, uh, about this new uh, boy uh, who is Prime Minister of France? Uh, is that because it's not important to be the Prime Minister of France? Or could they not find anyone who'd actually ever done a job before? In this case, I, it's hard to figure out what... Um, 
this uh, guy's um, credentials are. He's never held any senior ministerial position. You know, he was briefly um, minister for education. He was also a spokesperson for the uh, government. Um, it's hard to see what he has going for him other than that he's a kind of Macron's uh, mini me. He's, you know, he's like Macron. I mean, he's a kind of, he's a younger version of Macron, a sort of fairly vacuous character. Um, nothing much uh, to be said uh, for him. Um, good looking in a way. And of course, he's gay, which makes him somehow um, a bit trendy and somehow fashionable. Um, but <laughs> they, but but other than that, it's it's hard to know what Macron thinks he, he's doing. Other than he thinks, well, he's my uh, successor, you know, because he's just like me. Uh, France has a real problem uh, on its hands, which is that everything that um, Macron has been doing ever since he came to power in in 2017 has been uh, geared towards preventing uh, Marine Le Pen from coming to power. Um, but she's doing rather well in the polls, certainly ahead of him um, in, in the polls, certainly for the European parliamentary elections. And it could, you know, he, he doesn't want his legacy to be that after he departs, um, Marine Le Pen takes over. So he's scrambling around, but it's hard to see how this guy will be the person to, um, uh, to stop Marine Le Pen. Well, uh, I predict that uh, Le Pen will win the European parliamentary elections in France. Uh, I'm in France right now. Uh, and yeah. that's uh, certainly how it feels to me. Do you, you yeah, think, so think so too? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they've been, you know, the, the French elites have been trying to whip up this fear about Le Pen now for at least 20 years, you know, but. The, the trick has got old, you know, you can't just keep doing it. And you know, it's like, you know, oh, you know, Le Pen, Le Pen is, you know, becoming then, you know, France goes fascist. Uh, you know, it, the, the, you know all, all, all of the sort of French elites have been doing this, you know, starting from uh, Mitterrand and of course, Marine Le Pen's uh, father. But now it's, it's kind of boring and it's lost um, its, uh, its credibility. And I think the French no longer are afraid of Le Pen, and I think that uh, I, I think she'll win. And, and it's clear that the, if you just look at how how she's doing in the polls, she's never done as well as this. And and so therefore it, it shows that the whole thing of you know we, France can't go fascist is just you know that's it. It's just an old you know it's an old trick. It's gone. It's a little like with with Trump. You know you can how, how long can you go on saying Trump's a fascist, Trump's Hitler, Trump's Nazi, Trump will take away our freedoms. It isn't working, and 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 you know you you got you got to come up with something a little bit better. Now all eyes will be on uh, the Hague uh, tomorrow. Uh, I'm I'm saying, not everyone agrees with me, uh, that if the court were to find in favour of South Africa's uh, motion, uh, that uh, most European governments, if not them all would have to, as a matter of law, reverse course in relation to Israel in this uh, campaign in Gaza and, for that matter, in the West Bank. Do you see it that way? I, I'm, I'm not sure that I do. Um, first of all, I think there is a, a considerable hurdle that South Africa will have to meet because, um, you know, the, the judges... I think they t they do tend to vote according to the government that sent them there. So there's going to be obviously the the the, the countries that are uh, overwhelmingly Muslim they'll they'll favor uh, South Africa. But you know you've got the United States and the UK. Obviously they're going to vote against. Um, I don't know how France is going to vote, but I think there's a good chance that France will also vote um, against. Um, and then you've got how Russia and China will work. Well, Russia has a very complicated relationship with Israel. Um, I, I actually think that I have my doubts that Russia will um, support South Africa. And then China, you know, you know, we've had all these tribunals over the years, these fake, phony uh, tribunals. 
uh, claiming that uh, China uh, is committing um, genocide against the Uyghurs. So China doesn't really want to go down the path of um, you know, lending credibility to uh, uh, bringing genocide charges against states because China thinks, well, somebody's going to do that to us uh, down the road. So I, I, I don't know whether the, the the votes are there. They're going to have, they're going to be, there are 15 judges and I think they're going to add two more judges. So that's, that's 17 judges. They're going to need nine judges for it um, to go forward. Um, I'm not sure whether the, the votes are there, um, but but then, you know, I mean, even if it that goes forward, that's just simply a preliminary finding, you know, then it, it doesn't really address the the actual, um, you know, the, the legal uh, niceties of the case, which is going to take years and years to resolve. Um, but I think if, if, they, if, if the, the, the World Court at least says there is prima facie a case for genocide, I think that's going to have an impact. I'm not sure that it's, uh, it's going to alter um, uh, too, too many uh, states' policies, at least in Europe. Finally, George, uh, the situation in Ukraine on the ground, the military situation, uh, goes from bad to worse for uh, Zelensky. He's effectively run out of money and run out of soldiers. Um, they've, they've, they've pressed old men. Uh, they've pressed young boys. They've pressed women. They've even pressed pregnant women uh, into combat. Uh, five millions uh, of their people have fled and sure ain't going back. I spoke to uh, a couple, a Ukrainian couple, just the other night. Uh, the last thing in the world, I mean, they think they're lucky stars that they are in France. They will never go back, certainly not while there's a war on. Uh, so uh, if you run out of weapons, run out of money, run out of soldiers, must only be a matter of time before you run out of town, no? Well, one would hope so. Um, but it, it, it's clear that um, NATO and the United States are doubling down. Um, they're going to come up with some money from the United States with the, in these budget negotiations. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be $60 billion, but they'll come up with some money. Um, and then there is all this talk about this $300 billion of... Um, Russian uh, central bank reserves, and the Americans are clearly pushing the Europeans into handing that over to Ukraine. I mean, the Europeans are resisting, or whatever that means. We we know the Europeans never really resist the Americans very much. So they're going to going to give them some money, and I think you know the the, the Americans are going to pull uh, you know a surprise at the uh, the NATO summit in uh, in Washington uh, in July. I think they're going to try and push for Ukraine um, into NATO. Uh, I think the Biden administration is just absolutely demented. I mean, it, it's run by kind of de demented uh, figurehead, and and there's just simply no no restraint on it. I mean, I think I think they're going to try and do something so insane as uh, as as pressing uh, Ukraine uh, into NATO, saying this is a an emergency situation. NATO will have to just abandon uh, the rules that it's as governed as the new membership. Uh, we need to uh, get Ukraine in. I mean, a lot of people disagree with me, but I, I do mean, think that's going to be the July surprise at the summit. The Russians will have to finish the war before July then. I think so. I absolutely think they should do it because if they don't, I think that's going to be an unpleasant surprise coming to them. For the, the, the this will be the seventy fifth birthday, and this is going to be NATO's present to itself. Here we've done something for our seventy fifth birthday party. We've brought Ukraine in. <laughs> we we we've started World War Three. Uh, happy exactly. birthday! That's our, that's our little George, present for ourselves. As, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's right out of Dr. Strangelove, that one. You can almost hear Peter Sellers' <laughs> voice quivering. George Samuli, uh, Senior Research fel Fellow at the Global Policy Institute. Always a pleasure, a delight, actually. Thank, to thank you very much, George. And hear you. Thanks uh, very much for uh, joining us.